On a quiet November evening in 2015, a 911 dispatcher picked up a call that sounded urgent and filled with panic. On the other end was a woman named Jennifer, frantically explaining that her young daughter was choking on a piece of chicken. She sounded desperate, saying she had tried everything to help, her fingers, even a butter knife, but nothing seemed to work. The dispatcher calmly instructed her to perform CPR, guiding her step by step. Thirteen long minutes passed as Jennifer's panic grew, and then suddenly, silence. When paramedics finally arrived, they found the little girl motionless, but something didn't add up. Her injuries didn't look like those from choking, and as they examined her, more unsettling questions popped up. Bruises and marks on her small body hinted at a different story, one that didn't match Jennifer's explanation. So, who was Jennifer, and what really happened that night? The answers, buried beneath layers of secrets, would shock everyone and reveal a truth no one was prepared for. Layla Marie Daniel was born on July 18, 2013, in Georgia, USA. Her parents, Tessa Daniel and Anthony, faced challenging circumstances early in life. Two years before Layla's birth, Tessa had another daughter, Millie Place. Both Tessa and Anthony grew up in difficult environments. Tessa, from a young age, encountered significant struggles that led her into the child care system, spending her formative years in various foster homes. Anthony's experiences were similarly challenging, and when he and Tessa decided to build a life together, they lacked the stability needed to create the nurturing family they had envisioned. Unfortunately, their children ended up in a home marked by instability and toxic dynamics, as both Tessa and Anthony struggled with substance abuse and alcohol issues, compounded by a history of arrests. In light of these conditions, Child and Family Services in Georgia began conducting regular home visits. Their mission was to assess the well-being of the girls, ensuring they were receiving proper care from their parents. The results were consistently discouraging. Initial reports noted domestic violence, and a later report documented that the living conditions were unsafe after one of the girls left the house unnoticed by her mother. When Layla was one, Tessa's substance issues escalated, leading to her hospitalization for treatment, and the family situation continued to deteriorate. Millie went to live with her grandmother while Layla stayed with a family friend, Cynthia Tate, who provided a stable and loving environment. Despite Cynthia's care, Tessa's situation worsened, and in January 2015, she was arrested on methamphetamine distribution charges, resulting in a three-month prison sentence. Layla's father, Anthony, was also incarcerated during this time, leaving the girls in the care of their grandmother and Cynthia once more. Upon Tessa's release, she moved in with Cynthia but was required by family services to undergo a drug test, which she failed. Consequently, the authorities decided to place Millie and Layla in foster care under the supervision of Loretta Brown, an experienced foster mother who aimed to provide the girls with a more secure environment. By then, 
Layla was 21 months old, and Millie was four. Despite receiving love and care in several foster homes, social services continued moving the girls, striving to find the most suitable long-term placement. Meanwhile, Tessa remained actively involved in the adoption proceedings, determined not to lose custody of her daughters, hoping to reunite with them after achieving full rehabilitation. In May 2015, Millie and Layla were placed with Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum, a couple eager to provide temporary care, despite not being formally designated as foster parents by a placement agency. Jennifer, 27 at the time, shared a turbulent past with Tessa. Raised in an unstable and violent environment, she also dealt with a physically abusive mother struggling with addiction, leading Jennifer into foster care at age nine. Despite difficulties controlling her anger and a history of altercations, Jennifer eventually found direction, graduating high school and enlisting in the Army. She later pursued a law degree and gained respect in her community, even appearing on television and interning in a district attorney's office. In 2009, she married Joseph Rosenbaum, whom she had met years prior within the foster system. By the time of their wedding, Joseph was working as a corrections officer. Their relationship was seen as complimentary, with Jennifer being assertive and controlling, while Joseph, who suffered from cystic fibrosis, was described as gentle and reserved. This complex situation became an opportunity for Jennifer to craft an image of herself on social media as a savior, portraying both her and her husband Joseph as fighters overcoming adversity. With Joseph's struggle against cystic fibrosis, a disease that often significantly shortens life expectancy, Jennifer found herself particularly determined to build a family. Due to the illness, many men with cystic fibrosis are unable to have children, yet Jennifer was resolute in creating a family of her own, announcing her intentions publicly and making clear she would stop at nothing. Their first application to become foster parents, however, was denied. Jennifer had used her maiden name, and officials discovered her history in the child welfare system, including reports of physical mistreatment. This background disqualified her as a candidate for temporary motherhood. Undeterred, Jennifer submitted a second application under her married name, hoping her history would remain hidden. This time, she was asked to attend foster parenting workshops, and a detailed background check was initiated. Jennifer, however, was unwilling to be evaluated, seeing herself as an exceptional candidate given her own challenging upbringing and rapid achievements. She believed any child would be fortunate to have her as an adoptive mother, and the assessment process infuriated her. In a heated phone conversation with a child services worker, Jennifer lost her composure, responding harshly and even issuing threats. Her application was immediately denied. But in April 2015, while working in the courthouse, Jennifer spotted a familiar face, Tessa's grandmother. Seizing this opportunity, Jennifer conducted her own unauthorized research into Tessa's case, uncovering everything about the ongoing adoption search for Layla and Millie and Tessa's role in the process. She crafted a meticulous plan, contacting Tessa through social media and rekindling their connection from childhood. Presenting herself as a compassionate figure, Jennifer offered to take in the girls, promising them a loving home. At that time, Jennifer's life seemed almost ideal. She was preparing to run for a county commission seat in her third year of law school and had gained a promising reputation with a strong social standing and financial security. Her life appeared to offer a world of possibilities for Layla and Millie, convincing Tessa that this was the right choice. Feeling hopeful, Tessa contacted the case's social worker requesting that her daughters meet the Rosenbaums. 
Soon, Layla and Millie began visiting the Rosenbaum home. Despite being two, Layla was not yet speaking and had inconsistent eating habits, while four-year-old Millie acted protectively toward her younger sister. During these visits, the sister's temporary caregiver, Patricia Lambert, who meticulously documented everything related to the girl's care, noticed concerning signs. After visits to the Rosenbaums, the girls would return with burns and bruises. Patricia reported these incidents to social services, but her concerns went unaddressed. Persisting, Patricia even brought the girls directly to the agency, supporting her claims with photographs, but still no action was taken. Speculation arose that Jennifer, leveraging her professional connections, influenced the outcome. Jennifer even claimed the injuries occurred during visits with the girl's biological family, a false statement that could have been disproven had Patricia's records been reviewed. Ultimately, the system failed the girls. On July 24, 2015, a judge ordered that Layla and Millie be permanently placed with Jennifer and Joseph, bypassing essential requirements and paperwork needed to finalize their status as adoptive parents. After the girls moved in, Jennifer emailed Tessa, falsely stating that social services had mandated no visits for at least 30 days to allow the girls to adjust. Even after this period, Jennifer continued to fabricate reasons to restrict contact between the girls and their biological family, tightening her control and severing family connections entirely. Amid the ongoing manipulation, Tessa discovered she was pregnant again. Jennifer, who seemed intent on gaining custody of this new child as well, needed to keep lines of communication open and avoid further tension. Tessa, still somewhat trusting, often asked Jennifer to send her photos of her daughters. Although Jennifer had roughly 2,000 photos of Millie on her phone, she sent only the oldest ones. When Tessa specifically asked for a recent picture of Layla, Jennifer reluctantly obliged. The photo showed Layla with an injury near her eye, which Jennifer attributed to an accident at daycare. A false claim, as Layla wasn't enrolled in any such program. The case was overseen by a social worker tasked with making monthly home visits, documenting observations, and conducting private interviews with each girl to assess their physical and emotional well-being. However, none of the reports from these visits indicated any signs of trouble. Then, in August 2015, a neighbor noticed bruising around both of Layla's eyes. Jennifer explained that Layla had fallen down the stairs and hit her nose. Unconvinced, the neighbor, a nurse, urged Jennifer to take Layla to the children's hospital immediately. Hours later, realizing Jennifer hadn't sought medical care, the neighbor confronted her again, stressing the potential severity of head injuries in young children. Jennifer promised she would go the next day. Such concerning incidents continued. In October 2015, Layla sustained a leg injury, later diagnosed as a fracture at the emergency room. Jennifer claimed it happened during a gymnastics class at her grandmother's house, a statement that was later disproved when it was revealed Layla wasn't enrolled in any such activity. Then, on the night of November 17, 2015, a 911 operator received a frantic call from Jennifer. She reported that her young adopted daughter was struggling to breathe, supposedly choking on a piece of chicken. For over 13 minutes, the operator provided CPR instructions, but Jennifer claimed she was too afraid of performing the procedure incorrectly. In her panic, she described trying to dislodge the food with her fingers and even using a butter knife. Tragically, Layla passed away moments before paramedics arrived. Upon arrival, paramedics attempted resuscitation, but it was too late. They noticed concerning injuries on Layla, including marks on her back. When asked about them, 
Jennifer claimed she had no knowledge of their origin, citing Layla's adoption. At the hospital, further examination revealed a disturbing number of injuries, prompting staff to alert social services and authorities. Millie was also brought to the hospital, where she was found to have bruises in various stages of healing on her hip, head, arm, and back, clear signs of child abuse. A nurse noted that while Millie's injuries weren't as severe as Layla's, they were nonetheless concerning. This discovery led police to investigate the home environment, eventually moving Millie back to Patricia's care. The following day, on November 18, 2015, an autopsy on Layla revealed extensive injuries, including numerous bruises and fractures. The cause of death was identified as blunt force trauma to the abdomen, rather than airway obstruction as Jennifer had claimed. With these findings, Jennifer and Joseph were arrested. They posted bail and returned home, causing outrage within the biological family and the community. The case also sent shockwaves through the Child Welfare Department, leading to the dismissal of the two social workers responsible for overseeing Layla and Millie's case after an internal review found they had ignored critical warning signs that could have prevented the abuse. In July 2019, the trial against the Rosenbaums began, with 49 charges including murder, aggravated assault, and child cruelty in relation to Layla's death and Millie's injuries. Both Jennifer and Joseph pleaded not guilty, with Jennifer's defense claiming she unintentionally caused Layla's injuries while attempting to remove food from her throat. However, Millie's heart-wrenching testimony recounted specific incidents of physical punishment inflicted by Jennifer on both her and Layla, exposing the brutality of their treatment. In October 2019, both were found guilty. Jennifer was sentenced to life in prison plus 40 years, while Joseph received 50 years, with 30 in prison and 20 on probation. Jennifer appealed her sentence, arguing ineffective representation, but the state Supreme Court denied her appeal in March 2023. Layla's tragic death and Millie's harrowing experiences sparked intense public debate on foster care oversight and child protection laws, highlighting how a single failure in the system can lead to catastrophic consequences for vulnerable children. Thanks for tuning in to Unreal True Crime. If you're intrigued by mysteries from around the world, check out our new channel, Latin Crimes, where we dive into the gripping true crime stories of Latin America. Don't miss out. Subscribe now for more thrilling investigations.